Uh, Megan got her PhD at UCLA in computational cognitive neuroscience. She also did her postdoc there. Uh, she was on the faculty at UC Riverside in the Department of Bioengineering and joined uh, UCI Cognitive Sciences Department March 2020, which is pretty much when we shut down. So I think she welcomes the opportunity today to, to meet some of us virtually at least, and uh, we're delighted to uh, hear from her. And she's going to be talking about how we evaluate our own uncertainty. So with that, let's welcome Megan. We'll hand it over to her. Thanks so much um, for, for having me at this seminar. As, um, as Pedreg, I think I'm pronouncing your name correctly, said, um, I've, uh, I've been here about a year, but it feels like I just got here and I don't know anybody yet, um, really. So my department's been lovely and welcoming. But outside of that, I don't really interact with a lot of folks at, at UCI just yet. Um, and so I'm uh, today going to be presenting some stuff that's actually um, in the works. It's not finished yet. And, and my hope is that this will be a starting point for some conversations that we might have, uh, some feedback that you might give about uh, what you think I might be able to do better uh, in some of these projects. Uh, and uh, I see a few of uh, the members of my research group here in the audience, and some of them are working on some of these projects. So hopefully we can have some fun conversations towards the end. Um, so yeah, so I'll just get going then. And um, please do feel free to interrupt me for clarification questions or other things um, along the way if you want, but I've also been told that we kind of wait until the end for questions here. So either way is fine with me. Okay, so I hope you can all see this. So um, I'll, I'll start just by saying that what I work on um, in, uh, in my research group is metacognition, specifically perceptual metacognition in humans. And so I like to start out, uh, especially for an interdisciplinary crowd with, um, with describing exactly what I mean by that so we can all be on the same page. Um, and so the idea here is that your brain is constantly making perceptual decisions about the most likely state of the world, uh, the most likely cause of your sensory experiences, specifically here, your visual sensory experiences. Um, and so uh, this is you uh, in, in a state of visual uncertainty and you have eyeballs and you're viewing this kind of uh, noisy, corrupted, incomplete uh, visual scene with uncertain information in it. And your brain has to make a decision about the most likely cause of this sensory experience in particular uh, about the identity of this thing. And so in this little toy example, this could be one of a number of objects, a deer, a car, a tree, and so on. Uh, and so we make a decision or our brains make a decision based on this incoming information. We make an inference and say, that is most likely to be a car. Uh, but what comes along with this inference is not just the decision itself, not just a categorical choice, but also a sense of uncertainty or confidence. So you also have a sense that you're, that's definitely a car out there in the world, or that's probably a car, but maybe I need some more information in order to validate that decision. Uh, but importantly, it's not just this decision here that drives subsequent uh, action selection, uh, subsequent sampling of further information in the environment is also this sense of uncertainty. You're going to behave differently if you feel very sure in your choice than if you don't. Uh, and so it's going to impact further decisions like how fast should I drive? Um, where did I think that sound came from based on how confident I am that it had this um, identity or that identity? Uh, and then further afield outside of perceptual decisions, we can also see the influence of metacognition um, in uh, judgments that a student might make about whether to continue studying for tomorrow's test based on how much they think they have learned, um, or a doctor's decision about uh, whether to provide a particular diagnos to, diagnosis to a patient or whether to run more tests first to see what, what else might be going on. So we can see that um, not just in perception, which is largely what I study, but also in some of these other cognitive decisions, that the ability to evaluate your own decisional uncertainty, the quality of your decision-making process, and the likely, uh, likelihood of the, um, of the correctness of the output of that process, this is really important for an intelligent agent to be able to do. Uh, and so this is not just important for intelligent human and non-human animal agents, it's also really important for artificial systems to be able to do this effectively. Uh, and it's really important to understand how this process can go wrong. 
Uh, and so cases where the decision-making capacity is fine, but the metacognitive assessment part is not so fine, this could lead to really um, uh, scientifically fascinating, but also very debilitating disorders. And we see metacognitive deficits in disorders such as uh, schizophrenia, autism, uh, and neurodegenerative disorders, disorders in aging. So I think that this is a very broad field of study that hopefully is also of interest to a number of folks in this room, specifically on the artificial systems part. But where we're gonna start is by studying it in humans, uh, because if we can uh, reverse engineer how we do it, we do generally do a pretty good job of this. We're not like bumbling idiots just wandering around in the world and, and incapable of learning from our mistakes. Uh, so if we can figure out how we do it, we might be able to build better artificial agents in the future. So in my lab, this is how we study uh, this, um, this topic. So we use a combination of psychophysics and functional neuroimaging, um, so fMRI specifically. We also use computational modeling. So this is like building Bayesian ideal observers, really simplified uh, systems. And then we also use um, some machine learning to try to decompose what's going on, especially in the neuroimaging. So I'm gonna to touch on all of this stuff today. Um, and please, again, do pause me and ask me questions if, if anything is unclear. Um, and so we, we use this approach to, um, to engage in kind of two big questions that we want to go for. One is where, when, and how does the brain in metacognitive, engage in metacognitive computations? And the other one is, based on this, what can we learn about what metacognition is good for? Does it drive learning in subsequent decision making? And so on. Uh, and so the two projects that I wanted to share with you today, um, which again are both works in progress. So I'll put this up. I'm showing unfinished projects because I think they're kind of cool and I really would value your feedback. Uh, so the first is that we want to use uh, biologically plausible neural network models to understand metacognitive computations and mechanisms in the brain. And I'll say as a caveat, when I say biologically plausible, please put this in lo very large air quotes. This is like, it has a nod to biological plausibility, but we're not building spiking neural nets here. Um, and then we're going to hopefully be testing these models with real-time fMRI in the future. So I'll discuss a little bit of what that is. Um, and then I also wanted to touch on uh, another ongoing project that's kind of talking about um, based on where we think metacognition happens in the brain, what information is getting to that area of the brain? And then we can use that to kind of build um, if, if this is studying the functional form of metacognition, this is studying the inputs to that function. Uh, and so we're trying to get at it from kind of these multiple angles. So I'll start here, um, but again, uh, works in progress. Um, so please let me know what you think. Okay, so the first uh, project that I wanted to share with you all um, was this one. Uh, and the reason that I think that this is really interesting is that a lot of times when we study metacognition, uh, especially in say artificial agents, you have, uh, for example, an agent spitting out um, like a, a, any sort of deep convolutional neural net or something spitting out um, a probability distribution across multiple choice alternatives, um, given that uh, I think that the options are deer, car, or tree, I'm gonna spit out 80% car and 10% tree and 10% deer. And that's my probability distribution and therefore my confidence in my choice, which is car, ought to be 80%. Uh, and that seems to kind of be the standard way of um, reading out confidence in artificial systems. And it's the dominant view of how confidence works in human observers and non-human animals as well. The problem is that those types of standard models can't really explain what we're calling uh, metacognitive or confidence illusions here. And these are cases where I can manipulate the input stream of information to an observer and create conditions uh, where that observer has very high task performance. They're doing great on some sort of discrimination task, but they have really low confidence overall. They don't think they're doing really well. Uh, and I can also create conditions on the flip side where I can make someone really terrible at a task and think they're doing great. And from, um, I, I think these are kind of the, the scarier ones in some ways, because you can imagine cases, especially in human observers, where you create conditions where you make people think they're doing great, and so they drive faster, or they make the decision to press the button to fire the missile, because they definitely know what they can see on the video feed, and they feel like they're doing great when they actually have very poor discrimination capacity. And we know how to do this in the lab, 
to create these conditions. So what I'm showing here are two um, sample stimuli from a study back in 2015 by Ai Koizumi and colleagues. And uh, the idea here is that you're taking these sinusoidal gratings, so these are Gabor patches for those of you who do psychophysics, and you superimpose two of them and you make one of them slightly higher contrast than the other one. So the task is which of the two superimposed gratings has higher contrast, which is the dominant orientation. So you can see it would be kind of the left tilted one here or here. I don't know if that's coming through on your guys' screens, but you can kind of see that the left tilted one is slightly darker than the right, right tilted one. But I can also manipulate the overall contrast of both of these superimposed gratings. So here, the contrast of both gratings is quite low. Here, the contrast of both gratings is, is much higher, but I have also cranked up the contrast of the noise. So um, in reality, it doesn't really look like in the stimuli, but in reality, I can create conditions in the lab where you're just as good at telling left from right tilt dominant in this condition from this condition. But this is the condition where you report higher confidence empirically. And this doesn't look so scary on the face of it. We don't really care about people being able to discriminate the bore patches in real life. But if I make a real life version of this, you can see how this would actually become quite scary indeed. Uh, so this is an image that I just pulled off of uh, Google image search of a satellite footage of you know, a, a vehicle along a dirt road um, in some rural area. And in this image here, all I did in PowerPoint was just crank up the contrast, but I also dumped a whole bunch of noise on top of it. So in theory, the signal to noise ratio could actually be worse in the brighter image than in the dim image, but you might feel like you can see that brighter image better. And so this is a case where um, we have potentially very poor task performance, but a, a high subjective feeling of confidence in your decision-making process. So um, we know that this, this error, this um, kind of confirmation bias, if you will, uh, that the more evidence you have favoring your decision, the brighter it seems, uh, the more you think you can see, even if that's not the case. Um, so we know that this exists in the lab, we know it exists behaviorally, and now we want to understand where this comes from in terms of the neural and computational basis for it. Um, so this is an ongoing project, um, we're about one year into this project now, and the idea here is that we're going to develop and refine and use fMRI to validate a candidate computational model that we've built that can explain these illusions and where they come from. Um, and then eventually we're gonna use real-time fMRI, which I'll go into in a second, to try to uh, causally test the model, to actually push on some of the parameters in the model, um, to test it, and then potentially even rewire confidence to be less susceptible to these illusions in the future. So this candidate model, um, which was largely developed by my uh, postdoctoral researcher, Brian Maniscalco, um, that works kind of like this, and I'm not gonna go into huge amounts of details because it would take the whole hour to do so. Um, but the idea um, is that you have instantaneous evidence incoming from two potential decision alternatives, left tilted thing and right tilted thing. Uh, and then you accumulate evidence potentially over time in a dynamic stimulus situation um, in favor of one of these two decision alternatives. And then you have a feed forward inhibition that allows you to compute the relative evidence, not the absolute evidence for one or the other, so the green neurons, neurons here uh, are kind of um, produce a subtraction between the two yellow neurons for the two stimulus alternatives. And the idea behind this candidate model, this is a very standard framework to have this feed forward inhibition and feed forward excitation and so on. But our contribution here is that um, it's these green neurons that compute the relative evidence, the balance of evidence among multiple alternatives. Those primarily drive the decision. That's not a new, uh, premise. Lots of people have posited that before, but usually you would read out confidence also from these green neurons, from the relative balance of evidence among the multiple alternatives, just like you would read out uh, the normalized 80% probability uh, from it's a deer, a car, or a tree. You would read out the, the normalized, everything has to add up to 100% or a probability of one. Uh, our contribution instead is that it is these absolute evidence neurons that actually drive confidence. So once you've made a decision, uh, all you care about in rating your confidence 
is uh, how much evidence there was to support your decision. You forget about this subtraction entirely and you just say, I decided it's a car. How much car evidence do I have? Forget deer, forget tree, forget hippopotamus, forget anything else that it possibly could be. I just want to have the, the magnitude of evidence supporting my decision. That's my confidence judgment. And it turns out when you run this model, uh, it reproduces some very weird behaviors that we see in humans that are specific manifestations of this confidence bias that we see. So on the left here, I'm showing you a graph that is the simulation results here overlaid on human data. Uh, and so the, the solid lines are the model and the, do, the dashed lines are the humans. And you can see this kind of unique crossover effect where red goes down as blue and black goes up. And what this means is that people's metacognitive sensitivity, and I'll unpack that in a second, uh, gets, usually gets better as they get better at doing the task. So on the x-axis, you have task performance, a measure of D prime sensitivity. Usually, as you get better and better at doing a task, your metacognitive sensitivity also goes up. And this means that you get better and better able to assign high confidence when you're correct and low confidence when you're incorrect. Uh, typically, that's something that you want to be able to do, to be able to use your confidence to track your accuracy. And usually what happens is, as you get better at doing a task, your ability to assign confidence meaningfully also goes up. But there's this really weird thing that happens when you create conditions, like I showed on this previous slide, where you can create conditions where people think they're doing great, but are actually doing terrible and vice versa. And that leads to this selective reduction in metacognitive sensitivity for one type of response. Again, I won't go into details about the behavioral experiment because it would take a very long time. And I wanna share a bunch of other stuff with you guys. Uh, but the point is I can use this model to reproduce the human behavioral data and no other model that we tested that was kind of the more standard approach was able to reproduce this even qualitatively. Uh, and so I think that this is a very stringent uh, test and very um, compelling suggestion that some sort of architecture like this might actually be underlying our confidence judgments in our perceptual decisions. But of course, this is just a simulation. It's a cute simulation and it fits the data quite well, but it's just a simulation. So now we need to actually go and test this in human observers. Uh, and so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to take this model and we're going to use it to construct conditions that kind of selectively modulate the green neurons and the yellow neurons in different ways. And so what I mean by that is you can see that if the green neurons are calculating the difference in evidence between two stimulus alternatives, like a normalized kind of approach, that these green neurons might respond similarly to, uh, to um, conditions, stimuli, that I've created that have the same amount of relative evidence for two possible stimulus alternatives, but overall difference in absolute evidence. So what we've done here, these are random dot kinematograms. I don't know if you guys are all familiar with that, but it's, it's a circular annulus in which you put a bunch of dots that move around on the screen and it kind of looks like TV snow. And you can make them all blow coherently in one direction or the other. Um, and so I've created these kind of little blizzard displays um, where 15% uh, of the blizzard dots are moving in one direction versus the other direction, 12% are moving in the opposite direction. So this kind of looks like two blizzards going like this against each other. Um, and uh, then there are a few other dots that are just kind of moving randomly. Or we can have cases where uh, most of the dots are moving coherently in one direction or the other, but they're moving transparently. So you have um, the same, it, the, the task is, the same difficulty in this condition than in, in this condition because you have the same amount of relative evidence. So the idea is that we've created conditions that will kind of preferentially activate voxels in MRI. These are 3D pixels that contain different proportions of green neurons and red neuron, uh, yellow neurons. Uh, and so this is so we can actually select out from one voxel to the next, whether there is a higher proportion of what we're calling highly inhibited green neurons or less inhibited yellow neurons. Oops. Uh, and so um, the idea is because there's lots of density uh, or energy, motion energy in this kind of condition and very little conflict, it will preferentially activate 
highly inhibited, this is called tune normalization, highly inhibited voxels, because there will be a lot, like these inhibitory connections will not be activated in this condition. In these conditions, these inhibitory connections will be highly activated. And so the activity of the green neurons or the green voxels will go down, but the activity of the yellow voxels will not go down. So the idea is then that we can use this to identify voxels that contain mostly green neurons versus yellow neurons. Uh, and we can make behavioral predictions about how those voxels activity patterns ought to co-vary with behavior. So this is just a simulation prediction here, but the idea is that um, if we uh, separate trials of activity where I show you something like this over and over and over again, and I ask you to make a decision and then uh, rate your confidence in that decision. So like which direction is the dominant tilt? Now rate your confidence. Which direction is the dominant tilt? Now rate your confidence. If I do that over and over again, but then I split the trials in half based on whether the green neuron voxels were more active or the yellow neuron voxels were more active, just do a median split, um, then I should be able to identify cases where um, if our model is correct, if I split based on the yellow neurons activity, we see a difference in confidence judgments. So what this means taking a step back is that uh, if the yellow neurons happen to be hi more highly active, that should lead to higher confidence because they drive confidence, but it should have no effect on accuracy. And likewise, if these have lower activity, they just happen to spontaneously have lower activity on a given trial, that should lead to lower confidence, but again, should have no effect on accuracy because task accuracy and decisions depend on the green neurons, which are based on the subtraction or, or ratio between these two, as opposed to just the overall absolute amount of evidence. Okay, so that's what we're doing right now. Um, this is just a very quick update um, for, for where we are. We've got some pilot data collected um, and we're in the process now of using statistical analysis to identify which voxels are green voxels and which voxels are yellow voxels. Uh, and then we can go ahead and do this behavioral prediction and hope that it, it comes out okay. Um, and so stay tuned for that result and, and we will update you hopefully in the very near future. So uh, that's the, the phase one progress so far, but I also wanted to tell you a little bit about what we wanna do in phase two, which will be next year, because I think it's really exciting and also a really cool technique to be able to test some of this stuff. Uh, so this will be a correlation effect. If we find this, um, which hopefully we will. Uh, some pilot data looks quite promising. If we find this, this will tell us that our model is consistent with the, the behavior, uh, sorry, with the neural data that we're seeing. What this won't tell us is whether there is a causal relationship between the yellow neurons activity and confidence. It will only be correlational. And so what, what we wanna do to test the causal relationship between the yellow neurons activity uh, and subjective ratings or feelings of confidence is to do real-time decoded neural feedback. Uh, and so this is a non-invasive way of selectively modulating neural activity in humans with millimeter precision. So this is the most precise way that we have to actually modulate humans' activity, humans' brain activity without actually opening people's heads and sticking electrodes in their brain. Um, so you can think about this as kind of like almost optogenetics for humans, but without the genetic modification. So um, the idea behind real-time decoded neural feedback is this, uh, you put someone in an MRI scanner and you show them a, a sequence of images here, like look at a fixation dot and don't do anything Then I'm gonna show you TV snow. Uh, this is that blizzard stimulus that I noted earlier. It just kind of looks like dots blowing around in the wind. And then I'm gonna turn this off again. And during this period, I'm gonna say, change your brain activity, human subject participant. Think about stuff. And that's literally all of the information that I give to a participant to get them to actually potentially modulate their brain activity in the right way. So dot, change your brain activity and try to make the feedback circle, which I show you subsequently, as big as possible. And the idea is that if you change your brain activity in the right way, you happen to guess to think about the right thing, then the cer feedback circle will get big. And if you think about the wrong thing, then your feedback circle will be small and you won't earn as much money. 
And so what's going on under the hood is that we as experimenters have defined um, I, an ideal voxel pattern. Um, and so we measure in real time, we do the real time motion correction, real time with the temporal resolution that fMRI allows, which is like, um, you know, every two seconds we get, um, it's like one half Hertz. So it's not great. Um, but we identify uh, a target pattern of voxel activity and we measure the pattern of voxel activity produced by the human when we say change your brain activity and try to think about the right thing. And then we compare the ideal voxel pattern of activity to the target voxel pattern of activity. And if they match, we give you money. And if they don't match, we don't give you money. Um, and so the way that this has been done in the past is that you feed whatever the voxel activity pattern is here through, for example, a logistic regression classifier that has been pre-trained to identify the stimulus of interest. Um, and what we're going to do here in phase two, starting next year, is that we will actually have um, the, the target voxel patterns of activity will be, we wanna push on yellow neuron voxels and not green neuron voxels. And we want to selectively upregulate or downregulate those um, voxel patterns of activity in uh, target regions of parietal and prefrontal cortex. Uh, and uh, what's amazing about this technique is that um, it's been around for about 10 years now and we still kind of have no idea how it works. We know that it does work. We know that you can say, hey, participant, think about stuff and change your brain activity. Uh, and people will learn over several days of training to actually produce the target pattern of interest. So this is an intrinsically motivated, intrinsic motiv uh, modulation of brain activity. The humans are, are stimulating their own brains, but in this very spatially precise way that we want them to. So it's kind of a, a miracle and a mystery about how it works. There's some really beautiful work coming out trying to figure that out right now. But for now, we're just gonna say, great, we know it does work and we're gonna use it to actually test our model. And hopefully what will happen uh, is that if we push on the yellow neurons activity and we selectively upregulate or downregulate, those voxels activity or the, the activity of the voxels that primarily contain the yellow neurons, uh, then we will be able to selectively push around on confidence without touching accuracy. And this will eventually allow us to, um, through simultaneous activation of those patterns and high and low confidence patterns in prefrontal cortex, potentially rewire the connections between yellow to confidence versus green to confidence. Okay. So I know that was a lot of information. So I want to pause here before I go to the next one and see if there are any questions about this study in particular. Nothing? Okay. Well, please feel free to put something in the chat if you guys want um, to ask questions and then we, we can go on. Okay, uh, so I wanted to also um, talk about this project, um, which is the, so the, the previous projects that I just um, showed you are really all about trying to understand the computations um, that the brain is doing in order to give rise to this subjective feeling of confidence that we have in our decisions. So you make a decision about deer or car or tree uh, and then you, you kind of posit whether the same decisional machinery uh, or the same computations, the same equations, so to speak, are giving rise to your sense of confidence as, um, as did you give rise to your, the decision itself. But another question uh, that's very related is what is the information that's going into the metacognitive computations to begin with? So is it possible that there are um, that there are different pieces of information that are going into confidence as went into the decision. There could be uh, additional inputs that do not affect the decision itself. So it might be a difference in functional form of the computation. It could also be a difference in actual input information. And so this next set of projects um, that we're doing is trying to understand the flow of information uh, specifically from lower order visual areas to the prefrontal cortex. And this is because uh, the prefrontal cortex, which is up here at the front of your brain, um, 
specifically the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is the area that has previously been implicated in a large number of studies as being involved in these metacognitive computations. It's also involved in the generation, we think, of conscious awareness, but I will try to shy away from using, using the C word in this talk unless you guys really want to get into that uh, later on. Uh, and so we know that the prefrontal cortex is involved in metacognition and in consciousness. Uh, and so the question that we want to ask is, uh, what is the information that's actually getting into PFC? Because if we don't know what the inputs are, we're going to have a much harder time at understanding the computations that that area actually performs. Um, and so this is particularly uh, challenging also because um, the prefrontal cortex doesn't just do metacognition and consciousness. Uh, it's a pretty big area. Uh, and so even though um, Broadman's area 46, which is kind of like right here, seems to be the one that is largely involved in metacognition, even that specific tiny little area doesn't just do metacognition and consciousness. It also does a whole bunch of other stuff. So we know that prefrontal cortex is involved in all of these things that I have just put on the screen, in addition to a whole bunch of other things. So if we wanna narrow down uh, the information that is getting into PFC that might be specifically relevant for the confidence judgment in a perceptual decision about the identity of an object, uh, then we need to find a way to narrow down our study of what information is flowing from say here to there uh, to be task relevant, to be relevant to the actual like image categorization task that we are asking people to do. And so that's what this, this project is targeting, is trying to develop a way of understanding the quantity, nature, uh, and, um, and other aspects about the information getting into PFC that are specifically relevant to the perceptual decision-making task that we ask our participants to do in the lab or as they're lying in the magnet. Um, and so this is uh, a project that's being spearheaded by Mehdi, who is somewhere in the audience here. Um, and uh, the idea is that we're using some kind of standard approaches, but with a twist to try to, to get at this information flow. So I don't need to describe to this crowd what an autoencoder is, but please bear with me. Uh, so um, the idea here is that you have you know, an input image, for example, and you have uh, that is high dimensional. And then you have an encoding stage. This could be convolutional or fully connected. It could have kind of whatever shape you want it to. And the idea is that you get down to this like bottleneck. Um, so you, you compress the information down to its essence, and then you try to reconstruct from this essence uh, in a neural network framework through the decoder stage, you try to reconstruct the original input image. And the idea is that if you do this Correctly, you've, you've set up all your connections and you've got you know, the number of layers and the amount of convolution and the dimensionality of each layer and so on, you get this right, then this compressed representation here um, in this unsupervised learning framework really represents, again, the essence of the image or the categories that you're trying to, to understand. Um, and so we took this as inspiration, but then we do a couple other things to it. So usually what will happen if you're building an autoencoder is you will have an image like a picture of a cat or you use the MNIST data set or something like that. And you say, this is an eight, this is a three, this is that kind of thing. Um, and you try to reconstruct that same image through your autoencoder approach. Uh, you can also use this to try to get at the compressed essence of the representation in a brain region. So you take the voxels, uh, the 3D pixel activities um, in, in a, a brain scan, and you pass them through this bottleneck, and then you try to reconstruct that. And the idea is then, again, you get this kind of compressed representation in that bottleneck. That is the, the goal uh, here as well. But we wanted to take this a step further and say, if we have as input one region of interest and as output or reconstruction, a different region of interest that starts to look a little bit more like a autoencoder type transfer learning approach, where we're saying, what is the essence of the information that is being shared between these two regions? Uh, so we're, this is kind of a pseudo autoencoder, so to speak, um, or transfer learning approach. And so we chose uh, in our data set we chose as our regions of interest, the ventral temporal cortex, which is this area, it's kind of like right above your ears, like right here. So this is the ventral temporal cortex. And then we have our target prefrontal cortex as well. 
And the idea is we pass the voxel activities in response to viewing a bunch of these types of images in the scanner. We pass them from one region to another through this compressed representation bottleneck. Um, and we try to then kind of squeeze out the essence of the information that is being shared from one region to another. Um, and we do this across a large number of objects uh, and um, an animal. So we have 40 object categories. People lie in the scanner and they look at these different images um, and they are asked to kind of just look at the images and, and notice when the category is different from one image to a next. So I show you like butterfly, 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 chair, and you have to like press a button when, when the category changes. So we wanna do this um, to go from one region of the brain to another, but there's another thing that we would like to do in order to try to ensure that this compressed representation is actually task relevant uh, to this image categorization task, like butterfly, 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 chair. Um, and, and this is specifically because as I put on the previous slide, prefrontal cortex does all of this other stuff too. Uh, and so there's a lot of other things that might be going on that could lead to um, covariance um, across uh, different animal classes or different kind of moments in time even um, that might have nothing to do with, um, with the actual task in question. So we want to try to constrain this compressed representation to be task relevant. Uh, and yes, autoencoders are powerful because they are unsupervised, but we wanna add a supervised component to try to constrain that information to being task relevant. And so we're calling this just an autoencoder plus internally, um, where the idea is that we've taken our standard auto, uh, pseudo autoencoder or transfer learning approach going from ventral temporal cortex to prefrontal cortex, but then onto the bottleneck, we hook a classifier. And we've tried a number of dis different classifiers. I think actually this is a little bit older. Uh, we now just have a, a straight logistic regression classifier um, on here. Uh, so please ignore two of these uh, layers here. Uh, Mehdi will need to update this figure. <laughs> um, but, um, but the idea is that we wanna compress the representation uh, down as much as possible in the bottleneck while constraining that representation to being task relevant to this like butterfly, chair, airplane, cat, bird kind of classification. Uh, and so we've tested, um, and, and, sorry, uh, let me go back. This, this means that the loss function um, is the relationship between the predicted prefrontal cortical activity and the actual prefrontal cortical activity on the one hand, plus a loss function that goes with this classification here. Um, and you can see that as the dimensionality of the bottleneck grows, both the ability of the uh, classifier uh, to predict the category of interest grows. This is not super surprising. Um, and also the correlation between the predicted prefrontal cortic cortex activity and the actual prefrontal cortex activity also grows with dimensionality of the bottleneck. Less compression, you can predict better. That's not super surprising. Um, but what's really interesting is how this, um, this relates to uh, kind of more of a, stat, a standard autoencoder or transfer learning approach uh, where we don't have this classifier hooked on here. And you can see, um, take a look on the bottom here, the dimensionality that is required to successfully reconstruct the prefrontal cortex is basically identical between the two. Um, so it's not like we need any more or any fewer um, uh, uh, features in that bottleneck in order to actually reconstruct the prefrontal cortical activity. But by uh, hooking this classifier on um, during training, or here actually we're just testing a classifier that is trained on these bottleneck features after the autoencoder has, um, has been fitted, um, we can see that here the in incorporating this classifier hooked onto the bottleneck during training does constrain the features act and activities in this bottleneck to be very task relevant, relevant to this um, classification task among dog, cat, fish, bird, airplane, butterfly, chair, and so on. Um, and so uh, these features that are discovered by the autoencoder um, to reconstruct PFC just as well are much less relevant to the task when we don't include the classifier 
uh, in the in the training process. And this is not super surprising. It's not like we've discovered anything like fan, you know earth shattering here. But it's nice to see that we don't kill anything about the autoencoder's ability to reconstruct uh, the the target um, by hooking this classifier on. But instead, what it's doing, we hope, is actually constraining the information in the bottleneck to being task relevant. And this is just another representation of uh, the features in the bottleneck um, showing that once again, the one with the, the network with the classifier hooked on is, is kind of better at extracting task relevant information. Uh, and so uh, what we're showing here, I don't know if you can see this, it's very tiny, but this is ant, caterpillar, beetle, bee, cockroach, fly, bird, butterfly, and so on. Um, and so what we're showing here is just taking a, a representational similarity, a correlation, um, between exemplars of the same category. So butterfly one versus butterfly two, butterfly one versus butterfly three, and so on, and just correlating the activities of the features in the bottleneck on those particular exemplars um, versus correlating ant versus butterfly, ant versus chair, ant versus uh, whale, et cetera. And you can see that again, with the classifier hooked on there, we get much higher within category similarity than we do if we train the network without the classifier hooked on. Again, nothing earth shattering, nothing like, you know, particularly um, crazy here, but it's nice to see again, that this is hopefully letting us extract the task relevant information. So this is very early stages. Many literally sent me these figures last night. So we would love to hear your feedback on this. Um, but the idea now is that now that we've built these networks, we're hoping to use explainable AI approaches to really exploring what that bottleneck means. So this is here with um, 200 features in the bottleneck down from uh, two to 3,000 in each of these areas. Um, but we want to see if we compress it even more. Can we use explainable AI to try to understand what that what those features really mean? So is there a feature in the bottleneck that kind of helps us distinguish between things that are alive versus things that are objects? Uh, is there a feature in the bottleneck that helps us understand uh, whether something is big or small? Um, and so can we try to use some of these explainable AI approaches to, um, to push on uh, different features of the bottleneck, see what it does to the classifier, and then understand maybe what the nature of the information being sent to prefrontal cortex is. And then that would give us candidates to use as inputs to metacognitive computations down the line. Um, and so all of this is in service of what information is being sent to PFC. Um, and so just in the last couple of minutes now, I will briefly mention some kind of pie in the sky goals uh, for this project um, and, uh, and what might come next. So the first is again, to use that real-time fMRI decoded neurofeedback where we show someone a thing and we say, change your brain activity. And then we give you feedback and you know maybe it's good and maybe it's bad. Um, and you learn to change your brain activity uh, to produce a target pattern that is associated with a specific cognitive state. Uh, and so previously, again, this has been used to produce target patterns that are, go with like dog or red thing or high confidence, very low level kinds of ideas. And I mentioned that we are going to be using uh, decoded neurofeedback to try to push on yellow neurons and not green neurons. Um, we could also potentially use this as like almost a biological explainable AI approach. So if we can identify features in this bottleneck, which we think are related to animacy or size or whatever, and then we show people ambiguous images in the scanner and we push on these features, we might actually be able to push around on categorization and conscious, um, conscious perception in a really interesting way. And I know this sounds completely science fiction and completely crazy to use uh, this type of approach. Like how could we possibly have um, the spatial resolution or the temporal resolution to do this? And I don't have this on a, a slide here, but if you guys are interested, there is a really interesting study published just late last year uh, from Nick Turk Brown's group at Yale, where they, uh, they use decoded neurofeedback to push around on um, brain activity to, to push you through a, a two-dimensional space of little squiggly shapes that they created. So shapes that go from kind of more round to kind of more compressed and so on. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a good visual here, um, but they created this two-dimensional space of, of um, abstract images uh, 
abstract figures. And they use decoded neurofeedback to push around on like kind of your current, um, your current state in this two dimensional space based on your neural activity. And they changed people's perceptions. They made people see things as spikier than they really were, which is just crazy. So yes, making people see horses as shorter, stubbier, uh, taller, lankier dogs or something seems a little bit beyond what we can do right now. But the, the ground has been laid. And I think that this is a really exciting technique where, um, where we're going to start to be able to explore some of these models of how cognition, um, how cognitive states um, are represented in the brain in, in a much more fine grained way than um, we, we maybe have already. So um, that's my pitch for this exciting technique and, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, and then the last thing that I wanna say, cause I know I'm just about out of time um, is that uh, I mentioned that this all kind of looks like transfer learning um, and um, you also might wanna do some domain adaptation in the process because the uh, statistics of the, um, of the data set in ventral temporal cortex might seem very different from the kind of statistical distribution of the data set in prefrontal cortex. So in doing this kind of autoencoder approach, you might also wanna do some domain adaptation. Uh, and so we've started talking about this a little bit uh, and in particular, um, in talking about this with um, uh, Tal Coram, who is, um, he, I, he's a global scholar with the CIFAR um, Humans in the Microbiome Program. And I'm a global scholar with the CIFAR a Brain Mind Consciousness Program. And they have these little, these little meetings where they encourage people who would never talk to each other otherwise to talk to each other and come up with interesting ideas. So Tal and I started talking about this and we realized that this problem that we are having in biological scale data uh, with fMRI data, because it's expensive to collect and so on, is kind of exactly the same as what Tal is dealing with um, in uh, microbiome research. So the idea is that they he studies um, how microbiome affects um, maternal health in prenatal uh, stages of development. And so, um, and so he's trying to understand how to aggregate data across different labs and different people in ways that kind of get at the core truth of what's going on and that are domain invariant features. That's what he wants to discover. And well, this is exactly what we want to discover too. We want to discover domain invariant features, not features that are about the domain of ventral temporal cortex or of your brain versus my brain or that scanner versus this scanner. We want to discover universal truths about how information is encoded and represented in the brain. So Tal and I started talking and we realized that this is exactly the same problem. It just looks very different on the surface, but underneath it is exactly the same. Uh, and so we're developing this project now where we're trying to understand um, and, and kind of compare and contrast a bunch of these different techniques and how uh, they have been applied in human neuroscience and in microbiome research to try to discover if there are ways that we can learn from each other uh, to, to do better. Um, and so these are some of the examples of things that we're going to be exploring. So with that, I think I will stop um, and say that again, we are trying to study um, uh, perceptual metacognition specifically, but also kind of decisional metacognition in general using these, these approaches. But I hope that even though this was a, a pretty technical talk, um, that uh, you guys are, are potentially seeing how um, the results of some of these studies might be really important for building more intelligent artificial systems. So if you want your Tesla to be able to make decisions about what's out there in the world, whether to stop or drive faster, but you also want to be able to trust your Tesla and you want to know that it is judging its confidence in maybe the same way that you are. Uh, if we want to build ways to have humans and artificial agents interact in more collaborative uh, ways in the future, or we just wanna build agents that can do this stuff entirely on their own. I think it's really important that we reverse engineer the human brain first, then we can start fixing it maybe in people where it's gone wrong, and then maybe we can build better artificial systems. So um, I'll stop there and uh, thank you all very much for your attention. And I, I hope we can have some questions and some discussion. Let's thank Megan for a fascinating talk. Thank you, Megan. All right. Uh, if you would like to ask Megan a question, uh, you can raise your virtual hand. Let's see here. 
various clapping hands. We have to distinguish clapping hands from raised hands. Um, okay, I'll, I'll jump in with a clarification question to get started on the, um, let's see, I think it was slide 12 on the, the input and the output of the autoencoder. I was wondering that the uh, temporal difference, uh, is there a, you know, uh, the output is at a later time and how you decide that t uh, difference in time? That's a great question. Um, and because here we're, one of the, the hardest things to, to think about here is like, is this, are we trying to capture feed forward information flow? Are we trying to capture feedback information flow? Do we kind of want to capture both at the same time? And unfortunately, I think the answer here is um, we can't assume any meaningful temporal difference that we can possibly get at with the method that we have. So the temporal resolution of the fMRI uh, that we're using is one half Hertz. So you get a whole brain image every two seconds. And that's just like the brain works so much faster than that, <laughs> that, that uh, you can't really assume that there's any, it, it just, and it just smears across that entire two seconds. Uh, and so even when we're, we look at, you know, differences in um, acquisition time of the different slices of the brain, uh, it's just, there's this, Okay. And the signal that we're measuring is also the hemodynamic response function signal, which rises about six seconds after the thing is shown ish, but in some places it's a little faster. And so, yeah, so basically the answer is if we had a faster acquisition approach, that might be a really interesting question to ask. Unfortunately, we just can't ask it right now. I so it, it, it's instantaneous. It's at the same time, the input and the output. Right now, yes. Yeah. Okay. For the Thanks. input. Um, the reason there is that if, if we wanted to do some sort of like lag approach, if we had, for example, electrode recordings and like, you know, millisecond resolution in both places, then we could start to ask interesting questions about feed forward feedback and differences in, in temporal um, or in timing uh, where uh, the, the state of, uh, ventral temporal cortex now could predict prefrontal cortex at time t plus x. Um, x is a minimum of two seconds here. And so it's either simultaneous or so slow as to be completely meaningless, unfortunately. Thanks. Yeah. Mark, I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Megan, nice talk. Um, Thanks. So you talked in the beginning about cognitive illusions. And that, that sort of terminology suggests that the brain is computing something the wrong way, but cognitive illusion is usually also a good demonstration for how the brain solves problems in a very clever way, right? So what's clever about doing an absolute sort of confidence judgment that you don't normalize across the various categories? What is there a rational basis for doing that? Does it save you time, let's say? I'm really glad you asked this question. Thank you. Um, so I'll just go back to the, the slide here where I kind of showed what that looks like. Um, so I think uh, the answer is that on the surface, this seems like a really suboptimal strategy. That why would you use a completely different computation to compute confidence in a decision than you used for the decision itself? That seems like completely like resource wasteful to do it that way. Um, and I, th I think there are a couple ways that I might want to answer this question. The first is um, all right, how, how do I want to go through this in order? So, okay, I think part of the reason that this might look suboptimal or wasteful right now, and that it creates these kinds of really weird scenarios like this, where you can have increasing capacity to do the task and decreasing ability to use confidence to rate the correctness of your decision, that this potentially could be an artifact of how we actually ask people to do stuff in the lab. So in the lab, uh, you're in these types of experiments, you're presented with a thing and you're asked to categorize the thing, or you are presented with a thing that may or may not be there and you're asked to say, is the thing there or not? So we would call this a discrimination task or a detection task. But often in the lab, you're not asked to do both of those at the same time. You don't get asked like, is there a thing there? And if so, what is it? 
But if you think about what we do in the real world, that's exactly what we're doing all the time. There's, you never have this like, oh, I definitely know there's a thing there. Now I just have to figure out what it is. Um, or I have to decide if there's a thing there, never mind what it is. You're never doing one of those two tasks in isolation. So I think that in this case, absolute evidence or keeping track of absolute evidence is actually um, potentially a, a important strategy to, um, to allow the system to do both detection and discrimination without being optimized for one or the other. Um, so you kind of, you're, you're optimized across the tasks that you need to do. You're not optimized for maybe one task. So this suggests that what we're asking people to do in the lab and what we might call mathematically optimal in the lab um, might be just a reflection that we're, we're constraining the system. We're asking to squish the system into a box that it doesn't fit in. Um, I think also though, and I didn't show it here, but there are some other ways that you can, um, like if you build a, a Bayesian ideal observer for these kinds of models and you try to uh, understand what the, um, what the denominator is in the normalization for the Bayesian ideal observer. So it's you know likelihood times prior over the sum of all the possible stuff that can happen. If you put the sum of all the possible stuff that can happen, if you include nothing in that equation, then the behavior starts to look a lot more like these kinds of seemingly suboptimal behaviors in weird situations. I, I'm, not doing, I, I'm not doing it justice, sorry, I'd have to draw a picture. Um, but I think that if you assume that the system is doing simultaneous detection and discrimination at the same time, this suddenly becomes a lot less surprising. Um, and there's actually an interesting study that just came out um, last year, I think, in Psych Review. Uh, it's Miyoshi and Lau, and they did a bunch of simulations of this kind of uh, confirmation bias or positive evidence rule uh, against the balance of evidence under a bunch of different conditions. They basically sent their, their artificial observer through every possible study that you possibly could want to do in, in a psychophysics lab. And they found that overall, the metacognitive efficiency was actually better under this seemingly suboptimal rule across all of the things that they simulated. Um, uh, and under conditions where the, uh, signals for a, the signals for a stimulus, if it is present, uh, exhibit certain correlations, which they might do in the real world. Uh, and so once again, I think this stuff that makes it look like it's suboptimal might just be that we're trying to impose a cost function on the system that it's not actually using it's actually learned to use a different cost function entirely because that's the one that kept it alive. Thanks. We're running up towards two o'clock, but maybe time for a, another quick question if somebody has one. I'll uh, just make a quick comment, Megan, on the sort of on the, the same topic you were just talking about. There's a lot of interest in machine learning at the moment um, you know, discriminative model is very successful for um, object recognition, uh, but they they don't know what they don't know. So they, they're trained on key types of objects and it turns out to be surprisingly difficult to, um, you know, to get them to recognize the limits of their expertise, if you like. Um, and so people have looked at generative models that say, you know, how car-like is this set of pixels versus how deer-like as opposed to discrimination. And that turns out to be difficult to do in, in high dimensional pixel space. So uh, I, I just wanted to, it's just a comment that, that that's kind of a hot topic in machine learning at the moment. And it seems like there are some, some overlap with some of your work there, some, some, some relevance. Uh, you know, my, my own thinking, I, student working on this is that maybe there are two systems and um, you know, that uh, you can't just do it with pure discrimination. There, there just is no way to do it, so. I, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, there's uh, there's a, a researcher named Steve Fleming um, at UCL who studies perceptual metacognition largely, um, but he just won a, a huge new grant actually to do, how can we build metacognition into artificial agents? And one of the things that he's been really interested in recently is metacognition about uh, inference about absence so 
Like when you decide there isn't a thing there, how do you use metacognition to judge the likelihood that you're correct about nothing being there? Um, and so this is this is one of the things that he is now just starting to really like dig into. Um, and so you you might find some of his work on the human side. He's he's not a machine learning researcher. He's he's a, a human psychophysicist like me and, and neuroimager. Um, but most of his work, I think, is just incredibly brilliant. And so you might like to kind of read some of his recent stuff about that. Thank you. Yeah, great. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Megan. I think, uh, you know, very interesting intersection of, of your work and, and things we're doing in AI and machine learning. So uh, hopefully this will be the start of more conversations with for you with people in the AI and ML. I uh, encourage the students and faculty here to uh, follow up and chat with you. And uh, yeah, thanks again. So uh, we'll see everybody next week again. All right. Thank you so much.